Welcome everyone to this edition of Ask the Experts. My name is Frederico Links and I'm the editor of uh, Namibia Fact Check. Um, those of us who have been able to, to make this meeting, welcome again to uh, another session of um, Ask the Experts. Um, and we are joined today by Dr. Stanley Kanyemba. Um, and, um, and we'll be talking about sort of the lifestyle issues that uh, have become prominent um, um, with COVID-19 and what we as Namibians, but in general, what people can do to, to uh, you know, adopt a lifestyle um, that um, would enable them to weather, um, you know, diseases such as COVID-19 um, so that, you know, as much as we can um, in, in the absence of, of, a treat, of an effective treatment, in the absence of, of a cure, in the absence still of, of a vaccine intervention. Um, so the session deals with that. I'd just like to say at the start also that uh, this is once again brought to you by the Namibia Media Trust. Um, and this uh, session will also afterwards, because this is being recorded, this will also afterwards be available um, on the NMT's Facebook uh, uh, page, because this is also being streamed live on, on the NMT's Facebook page, as well as on the NMT's YouTube channel. Um, so um, welcome everyone, those who are here and those who are um, still you know, going to view this later on. And I hope we, you find value in these sessions. I certainly think um, they are valuable in these times. Um, so that's the housekeeping. Um, Dr. Kanyemba, can I just ask you to introduce yourself um, professionally um, to the audience and then um, also just state what your role is at this time in Namibia's COVID-19 interventions. Thank you very much. Uh, welcome everyone. Um, COVID-19, as I said, is, is an interesting disease. It has brought so many of us together. And I think from that perspective, it's actually something that, that perhaps we should look at in terms of, of the outcomes, the positive outcomes from the disease. Myself, I'm an orthopedic surgeon by training. So you would wonder why an orthopedic surgeon would, uh, because this is a premise largely of, of, of uh, intensivists and, 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 and physicians. Um, but I am uh, currently working both in the private sector and in the state sector, uh, both at uh, Kadutura State Hospital and uh, Venduk Central Hospital. The beginning of the disease, uh, many of us, especially those ones of us that worked in the state had to come together and then we had to sort of look at in terms of what the state is actually doing on the ground and how we should uh, reorganize ourselves. Um, us, especially in the surgical uh, specialties, had to step a bit back and then and, and, uh, realign our, our, our workforce and our a lot of our support staff uh, to COVID-19. Um, so my initial involvement really was in, in sub supporting everyone else. Uh, Dr. Caveto, who's our, I'm sure some of you have seen him on TV, who's actually our principal in terms of clinical response. Uh, we had to help him in terms of preparing, especially in Kadutura Hospital. We had to help him in preparing uh, the former TB only isolation hospital. We had to make the facility uh, part of the facility into a COVID ready facility. So, so, so that's why I got involved with COVID initially. Uh, secondly, also uh, one had to volunteer uh, to get involved into ICU. 
as specialists, uh, many of us are trained into ICU, looking after patients that, that end up in ICU. Um, so one had volunteered to, 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 to get involved into ICU, um, especially if you think about it, a lot of our intensivists are uh, uh, mostly exhausted, uh, so they would need uh, uh, those of us that, that know a bit about respiratory support to also, also help from that side. Uh, so uh, one has been involved on the ground and uh, in, in, in helping wherever it was possible. And also in terms of, of, of some of the standard operating procedures that especially came from the state, in terms of, of the specialties that one was in, we, we had to come up with protocols. Uh, for example, how, how we would triage our patients, uh, what our immediate priorities would be. And then and initially, if it was a disaster situation, how we would realign ourselves. Um, and also in terms of, of looking forward into how the health system would look, look like post COVID. Uh, so, 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 um, my real involvement in the state has 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 allowed me to be involved in all the, all of that, and also looking at where the health system is going and how the health system is coping. Uh, yeah, maybe I should I should just uh, just pause there. I, I think I mean that's an interesting uh, point that you have ended on there. And, and, and for me, the obvious question is, I mean, we spoke in the last session, we had the executive director of the Ministry of Health and some of his staff on in the session. Um, and um, we heard their assessment of the health system. So maybe just from your side, I mean, um, looking at your involvement to date in the COVID-19 response, what, what would your assessment be of the health system at this stage um, overall, both? in terms of the public sector health system and the private sector health system, because you straddle both. Um, how would you assess the, the, the status of the system at the moment? Uh, Mr. Lenz, I, I, I think it's, it's, it's um, we come from a very difficult past uh, and we are moving towards a very difficult future. And I think the challenges of the health system both ways, whether it's private sector or state sector, it's, it's something well known. Um, um, especially because I'm, I'm, I'm really interested in, in public health because when one, when one looks at health in terms of, of, of the sustainable development goals, yeah, uh, and then universal health care, uh, what, what, what the United Nations is saying about universal health care. Uh, the, the trouble with the Namibian health care system is the fragmentation and the separation. Because the challenge of the health system is you cannot treat health as a commodity as such. Uh, so therein is the challenge where if you cannot treat it like a commodity, how do you then structure it within a very divided society like ours? Um, how, how, what, what do you prioritize? Um, I'm an orthopedic surgeon. Uh, orthopedic surgery is very, very, very expensive. Uh, what ends up happening is that uh, now, especially in situations like this, um, because I'm not really uh, seen as a priority, especially in some sectors, um, state sector, because they might have uh, women and child issues that they might want to budget. Uh, that, that, that's, that's really the sort of the challenge for us, as in, um, remember when, when COVID-19 started, there was this whole issue of how will Africa cope, um, especially in terms of, of, of uh, their, 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 their system not being as, as sophisticated as, as, as it is. And then even with our colleagues, uh, I remember our first meeting as specialists working in state, we were sitting and talking and saying, look, how do we realign ourselves? Um, right now in the current system, uh, ICU is just seen as something for intensivists, but that can no longer be. We need more ICU facilities, but where are you going to get the manpower to run those facilities? Uh, are we going to run our redesign, how we, how we do our calls? Um, are some of the resources going to be sent there? Um, those are perhaps the, the, the forward going questions. And then one wants to remain positive in terms of that. Um, how do we realign? And then Mr. Lynx, I, I think that's the question at large. How do we realign both the private sector and the state sector to provide the same healthcare, right? 
Um, if, if, if the, the definite thing that we know is that things cannot stay the same, that, that is, I don't think anyone argues with that. But how do we almagate? How, how, do we, how do we come together? That's perhaps a challenging question. And then, Mr. Um, our new ED is, is a very innovative, uh, very hardworking ED. And then um, one also looks at, at, at who will come to the health system as, as our new minister, because we sort of need that person to sort of draw the two systems together. I know there's a look into, similar to South Africa and national health insurance system, and, and that's perhaps the discussion that COVID, COVID has actually hastened that discussion to, to say that, look, we need to pull together in, in terms of that. Your ICU bed in med clinic cannot just be for med clinic. It, it needs to be shared somehow. Now, how do we compensate for that sharing? I, I think that's, 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 that's the challenge now. Let me pause then and allow you to also interact. Um, so I'm going to, I mean, for those of us who are here, uh, David, I see there's only David still um, online with us. Um, if you have any questions, please just, uh, just you know, switch on your mic and, 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 and ask your question. Um, but that's it. I, I, I just want to get back to the whole um, Africa response um, to COVID-19. I think, I mean, it, it's, it's clear to everybody um, you know, Africa has, has been the standout. Um, yeah. The continent has been the standout in terms of COVID-19. Um, it hasn't, you know, many predicted that we'll be the ones that will, you know, suffer the greatest consequences. Um, we'll have the most deaths and, and, and it will, COVID-19 will just go wild on this continent. And that hasn't happened. Um, what do you, what do you, I mean, I think, I mean, for a lot of people, you know, and you continue seeing these articles out there, why haven't we seen the deaths? Why haven't we seen the infections in Africa? Um, so what is your, what is your take uh, on that? Um, yes, Mr. Lynx, uh, a very interesting and exciting uh, question. Um, one, must, one must comment, uh, especially very, 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 very stressed uh, um, governments like the South African government, the, 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 their response to COVID was absolutely. Me having trained at Chris Ani Baragwanath Hospital um, in Johannesburg, having worked in uh, King Edward Hospital in Durban, and knowing the extent of challenges that South Africa was facing, and for them to have rolled out the type of program they have rolled out, it was it was absolutely impressive. Um, and and I, I think if our leaders really, really used uh, that, that program to look at the issues that our people faced uh, with overcrowding and, and, and the determinants of, of, of why a disease spreads and, and them being honest about it, you, you must realize that it was a mammoth task. I remember a few years ago where, where ex-president Becky was in charge and then the HIV pandemic also came around. It was really difficult for African governments to admit <laughs> some of our shortcomings. Coming to how um, we are not devastated by, 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 by HIV, th this is an interesting part about diseases. Um, this is why certain people don't understand that medicine, even though you have studied medicine, it, it, it sort of uh, depends on the population group and population dynamics. Now you, you find that in Europe, if, if you looked at the susceptible age groups, it was the very, very elderly, yeah? So, so, so Europe has a very mature population. So their numbers, uh, for me, that's one of the main reasons I would say. Their numbers is that they have a higher um, population in, from 65 up, while a life expectancy in a place like Namibia is about uh, 45, 55 years. So we have a younger population group. 
that 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 I would say is probably the fundamental reason um, that that our elderly, because if you, even if you look at our death rates currently, it's the elderly um, uh, population with multiple comorbidities that are getting affected, and th those are the ones where we really see the mortality. Now, in terms of the other factors, um, Corona is actually a virus. Yeah, I would say, and th here's an interesting one. I would say that somehow the amount of antiretrovirals in terms of HIV, please don't quote me on this. This is between us <laughs> as journalists. <laughs> Adopt me as a journalist. I think there was a protective factor from there. I honestly would, would love to see from this um, mortalities that we have, how many patients that are on a ARVs actually passed on. No one talks about this. But that's, that's the story with viruses. Viruses are very, very difficult to treat because they, 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 they have that ability to change. And then because of that ability to change, that's, that's why um, we have problems with flu. But I would say, even if you look at remdesivir, uh, the antiretroviral that's been used for, for, for that has been pundit to be used for, 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 for HIV, uh, for, for coronavirus. How about all the other uh, medication we have with HIV? Is, is it, doesn't it form a, a protective uh, um, sort of situation within the African population? Then you move to other things like the Ebola virus uh, that's been happening in, in East Africa. The way East Africans are able to deal with Ebola, uh, the hemorrhagic fever, I think the learning process from that has also translated into how to deal with, 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 with things like Corona. Uh, because I don't know how many times have we heard about Ebola, but it doesn't become this uh, thing that blows out irrespective of our so-called limited resources. It gets controlled very well. And probably those experiences has translated into our public health programs that if something happens, we can mobilize quickly with our little resources and those resources and those responses are, are, are probably very, 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 very effective. So, so maybe let me stop there because I've raised a few very controversial topics and then uh, maybe you can, we can interact. Yeah, I think it's a, it's a very interesting discussion, especially now that you're seeing, you know, sort of the figures going up in, in Europe and America and, and in, in Latin America, it's also remaining very bad. And here we just seem to be, you know, th there are no dramatic increases or decreases, but the virus is also not, you know, it just seems to be, uh, uh, have reached this this plateau in, uh, on the continent, and it's slowed down immensely. I think over the last few months. Um, so I mean, there's, there's a lot there to research. I think in terms of for for medical researchers to 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 figure out what what happened on the continent and what is busy happening on the continent. Um, so in terms of, I, I I just want to ask you to say something about. You know, uh, the, 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 the local World Health Organization um, daily um, situation reports. I mean, the numbers of healthcare workers in Namibia, I think it's almost 500 now that have been infected. Um, what impact has this had um, on, on our, our response on, on, you know, beyond, uh, uh, not just in terms of the response to COVID-19 within our public health sector, but also in terms of responding to other um, health, um, you know, sort of issues and sectors beyond COVID-19. What, what, what has the impact been? Mr. Lungs, um, being, being a very young uh, specialist and, and being born here in Namibia, um, one wants to stay away from controversy. Um, one wants to stay away from controversy in terms of being positive about things. Um, the answer to your question also, one should look at the psychological impact of the disease and then also looking at um, uh, what WHO has trying, was trying to warn us against, where our limited resources are suddenly just being funneled into um, one disease. 
Um, I, I think one must also raise the fact that there was an hepatitis E uh, pandemic before the, the COVID uh, pandemic. Um, the, the, the lessons of both hepatitis E, COVID together towards the health uh, system perhaps was uh, multifactorial. Initially, let me speak about the clinical things. Clinically, we had the challenge to say, let's not change everything into just one disease and let other diseases fall. What I personally raised with my colleagues is, look, now we have an opportunity, and perhaps this is a suggestion to, to the powers that be. We have an opportunity to, to look at our health system and see where we can expand. Um, we no longer have, have the shortage of medical staff that we had a few years ago. So one would perhaps like to see the numbers of, of healthcare workers that were employed with the resources of, of COVID-19 to become permanent staff, yeah? However, if they become permanent staff, um, one of the suggestions that I always gave is that we need to strengthen our clinics, yeah? and our primary healthcare centers. Um, I was also on record saying that perhaps local authorities should actually go into running our clinics, yeah? So, so in terms of an impact, that is where one wants to suggest things to go forward. Because Mr. Lengs, if, if you look at COVID-19, it will not go under the table and, and disappear. Uh, but it's, it's, it's a good thing because it, it tells us that our public health system needs to be ex expanded. Because if we can expand our public health systems, if you are saying we've got 10 clinics throughout Ventuk and, and there's a pandemic that flies. Uh, remember that we had almost at Robert Mugabe Clinic, we, we actually almost had a shutdown. But if you have uh, clinics that are expanded throughout the uh, city of Windhoek or even throughout Namibia, the, 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 your reach of your healthcare system in terms of your healthcare staff will be much more. Yeah? Um, in terms of employment, there will be more of them that are being employed. Because, because if, if, if you look at the newspapers, you still see that there are lots of unemployed uh, nursing staff. Um, there's also this thing of, of, of doctors also now joining that unemployed uh, crew. Another suggestion that one might have, and this is again between you and me, thinking no one else is listening to us, we have this issue of, of Namibian doctors that went to study and they have a problem registering. Perhaps paramedical, paralegal support staff looking into public health care. Those are the solutions one can make. Um, so, so, so instead of, of, of going to see, look at our challenges, one wants to expand and say, these are the opportunities that are presenting. I'll give you a very good example. When City of Ventuk started having the ambulance service, it was an excellent service. Um, and, and that is what COVID-19 is showing us that perhaps Government should not be the only one, government as in Ministry of Health should not be the only one looking after health. It should be that employment now, uh, why doesn't City of Vintuk take some of this clinic and, and make some of these colleagues part of their, their, their employment uh, um, staff? Uh, they are definitely, you'll see that the, one of the challenges of, of public sector is, is in terms of, of, of remuneration. Now, if you have, uh, City of Vintu employing nursing staff, perhaps especially th 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 that would be a response that would be effective. Another one is at our airports. There are no clinics at our airports, uh, all our ports of entry. Why doesn't our airports authority, uh, our ports authority, why don't they now um, have a healthcare uh, division? where you are having uh, epidemic control staff that are part of, you understand Mr. Lynch where I'm trying to go. There is so much potential that came from COVID rather than speaking about challenges. Look at employment potential, look at even in terms of, 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 of 
all your tenderpreneurs and, and different sorts of people that went into hygiene management. That, so, so from that, you will actually realize that I'm more excited than, uh, so, so the disease has, I was telling somebody the other day, at least now I can talk about uh, medical and health very openly because so many of us are more receptive. So for, for the message goes to my healthcare colleagues to say, it's actually our time uh, to, to shine and show how important we are into the whole framework of, of society. So uh, I don't see, um, uh, there was that thing of, of we're getting infected and then we are the front line and that is one way of looking at it. But another way of looking at it is the potential of where health can grow. It has exposed and we can demand that large organizations should actually recruit healthcare staff as part of their staff complement. I think let me stop there to, to allow for a bit of more interaction. No, I, I definitely agree with you about the whole decentralization of, you know, sort of your health sector, because I think as, as you point out that um, needs to happen now at local authority level, at, at, at organizational levels. Um, um, it needs to happen. Um, yes, and I, th I think we did ask, I can remember we asked about um, healthcare, what, what's going to happen now with the borders opening um, when we spoke to the executive director and his staff um, with the borders opening are there facilities at those border, those three uh, uh, land border points that will address the, the, the issue of testing and, and, and tracing at, at those entry points? Because if we open up, you know, people will start coming in and, and where do they go in Namibia and, and so on, how are we going to control that situation? And they, you know, they, they said there was, there were things being rolled out to address that situation, in, including I think coming is a is an a, 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 a test and trace uh, no no a, a trace and track um, um, what do you call uh, a application for for our smart for smartphones um, that's going to be introduced over the next few weeks or months I think that was that was what was said um, to manage the situation so yes I think there's for Namibia there is room for innovation in within this COVID nineteen space definitely. Um, if there are any questions, I, I don't see any questions yet from any of our attendees. Um, perhaps on, on Facebook, there are questions. Uh, I'll just wait for the NMT associates to just, colleagues to just send me um, the questions because I, I can't see what's happening on Facebook. Um, no. So if there are any questions. In the meantime, I think we just, um, I think we should talk about the sort of lifestyle um, you know, um, elements that about Namibians that that we can address and that we can encourage, encourage Namibians to address. Um, so I think one of the issues is, of course, uh, the diet of Namibians. Um, you know, a lot of our households of, of, of our citizens are food insecure. Um, I don't know if you've given this any thought, um, but but what would you what would you what, what would you, your take be on, on, on sort of the lifestyle issues? Now, Mr. Lynch, you, you can now realize why COVID-19 has excited me. Because remember, these topics would have been taboo to discuss pre-COVID. It would have been, uh, there's this thing of, of, of our poverty and our division and our, uh, our extreme poverty being something we do not discuss. Me as a healthcare worker, it's obvious because I see it every day. I want to do something for a person, but he's got other issues that need to be sorted before I can do this for him. Even if I do this for him, I, I send him back to the same, you, you, you understand. And perhaps from, 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 from those that are our leaders, it, it also shows, that this is, this is why I'm excited. It shows what we as health professionals actually go through when we are treating somebody. It, it's not a matter of just giving a pill. It, it, it's more, um, uh, I was at a very good undergraduate program where we were actually taught about our social advocacy role. 
Um, now, our social advocacy taught us about um, uh, health being biopsychosocial. It's not merely the absence of disease, but it's your whole biopsychosocial well being. And perhaps this is a fundamental um, beginning where I remember in the, in the newspaper, there's this whole thing of big and then the uh, big being. Um, it, it big should be here yesterday. I, I don't think this is something to discuss. It, it, remember, look, we, we are looking forward to development, but Mr. Lung's development in our lifetime will perhaps not happen. And unless you and I are fish rod, you and I don't want to, to upset, the, upset the social structure, to get wealth that, that, that we don't uh, necessarily, uh, you understand? For me, I can see all, because I work both in, in state and in private, I can see the wealth differences. The, the, the patient that's referred, because I do joint replacements um, uh, for a lot of our, our, I'm now probably the only one left to do joint replacements. If I have somebody referred from Chumque, his priorities are completely different. And, and I don't look at him, I look at him as a father, I look at him as a member of society. I look at him as a provider. Now, how do you only consider, you have brought this person to Ventuk, you do whatever you do, but you put him back into the same society. So perhaps that social advocacy, the social advocate in me, which is actually why I thought I became a doctor, that should be addressed. Um, so that's the lifestyle issue. Basic income for everyone, just, Mr. Lengs, please, just to have food to eat. Nothing fancy, just to have, no one should go hungry in a country, in a society like ours with 2.5 million people, yeah? No one should go hungry. Second issue is overcrowding. Please, 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 please. We have so much land. Why is it that our squatter camp behavior is still allowed to continue? Because we know it's actually why diseases spread. If COVID-19 has not taught us that, then even God, when he comes back, he will not be able to convince us about anything else. And, and with that, housing, there's so many issues. Sanitation and, 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 and water comes into play. You cannot talk about wash your hands and stay at home. Stay away. Like, most of the time, I depend on, we sleep on our beds in the shift. When you sleep, I'm at work. When I come, you go. That is what is happening in the significant majority of our society. That debate cannot be left with COVID. That debate, and then, one was encouraged to see how government is trying to spread our population out, especially with what happened in Wallfish Bay, and they are trying to resettle. Mr. Lenz, I don't know. With the powers that are vested in U.S. media, it's, it's a shame that we still allow squatter camps in our population group. It, it doesn't matter. Namibians are very innovative, but just space them out. Space them out. Give the guy his plot of land, yeah? Let him build there. Water and sanitation and housing you have covered. Coming to our diet, so uh, I'm, I'm, I'm progressing. Coming to our diet, we don't actually have a national diet. We don't have a national diet that's affordable, nutritious, and sustainable. So perhaps, you in the media must start driving the discussion. What is our national diet? And as, as an, I'll throw it to you, just in terms of cost, how much does a breakfast, nutritionist breakfast cost in Namibia? How much does a lunch cost? How much does a dinner cost? And we need to now, because I think you and me, we are the same in that we both have a social advocacy role in terms of what we report. We are also social advocates. So we need to get into the discussion of why is it so expensive for us? If we are saying we've got the ocean and fish rot, yeah, 
why is it so expensive for fish to become part of our diet? That should be non-negotiable. For a net exporter of fish, is, is fish really part of our diet? For the net exporter of meat, is meat part of our diet? What is part of our diet? So that discussion has, so I'm thankful for COVID. Finally, we are all doctors. Finally, we can, we can all look into those things. Washing of hands, we cannot talk about. Sanitation, we cannot talk about. We cannot continue making these things seem as if they are not having a detrimental effect on people's lives. Um, we, we can't. There was a hepatitis E epidemic that somehow has been swept, conveniently been swept over and under the cake. One of the reasons why, you know, I was talking to a friend of mine. I, I wonder if in Europe we didn't have, if, if in Europe we didn't have so many dying, if COVID was also even go, going to be as, as whatever, as uh, famous as it is now. Really, I, I would not think it, it would have been. Uh, because uh, I think that's why it, it's having so much attention. Be because we still have uh, other big causes of death within Africa. And, and I hope, well, Mr. Lenz, I've answered you in terms of now we are actually on, we shouldn't even housing, basic housing, sanitation, nutrition, uh, big, uh, those four, uh, they are no longer discussable. We have enough resources. Uh, we have political commitment, I believe. Uh, we perhaps don't have, uh, people are probably still hungry and still, um, uh, yeah. So Mr. Lings, I, I hope that that is the debate you and I will continue having in terms of, 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 of what it is. Let me stop there and, and, and allow you to come in. No, no, I, I, I certainly agree with you. I mean, I, I think, I mean, it's also characteristic of, of our sort of um, um, natural landscape that we have because our people are spread out um, and, you know, there's so little that we can grow on, on, on the soils that we have. And, and there's this, you know, the meat diet, the meat heavy diet amongst a lot of our population, um, which is also, you know, sort of um, a, a contributing factor to, to you know, you know uh, um, the the crisis of obesity, which is also you know starting to emerge, I think, as a crisis in Namibia, and especially in in, in the COVID nineteen situation, where this has become, you know, obesity has become sort of a, a multifaceted comorbidity issue in 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 the context of of, of COVID nineteen, especially in countries like the US and and and, and Britain and so forth. Um, but of course, I mean, there's the issue of malnutrition, which, you know, sort of exposes us, um, a lot of our population to, to diseases of this sort. And I, th I think we can't take the, the view that COVID-19, COVID-19 is a dress rehearsal for something that might come that will be far worse. And, and, and the question then becomes, have we learned the lessons um, of COVID-19 um, because COVID-19, we, we have had previous coronaviruses. The last one was in um, um, 2009. Um, and then before that, so there's been this spacing of 10, 10 12 years. Um, the next one might come sooner because of changing climate and environmental issues and things like these. And then it could be much worse or it could be, you know, um, um, not as, as bad. Um, so, you know, you, you, you look at these things and, and, and you wonder, I mean, me as a journalist, I wonder, are the lessons being learned? Um, and are these lessons filtering through the entire society um, so that, you know, everybody um, is, is at, at some stage going forward, we, we all are prepared to deal on, on a personal, on a collective level with, with, uh, with these, these sorts of crises when they emerge. Um, because, I, I, you know, we, we don't want to be in the situation that, as an African country at the stage where we are, in the situation where the US is, for instance. I mean, we're all looking at the US and, and just wondering, I mean, how did that country 
get it so wrong. Um, you know, and, and how did the U.S. get it so wrong? That this is what we were supposed to look like. But this is the U.S. Um, at every single level, the incompetence and ineptitude is just, it's for the whole, it's there for the whole world to see. You know? um, and, and, and we should learn from that, what we're seeing happening in the U.S. Um, and, 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 you know, um, going forward. So, I mean, uh, in terms of, of, you know, you've already sort of sketched some of the issues that you think um, where, where we can innovate, but, you know, maybe just a little more on, on looking at taking the wider view um, and, 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 and looking at where, I mean, I agree with you on, on things like, like a big and, and, and various other things, health system related issues, decentralization and so forth. Um, where do you see the low hanging fruit? You know, where's the low hanging fruit for us going forward? Um, Mr. Lynx, uh, I, I'm getting excited as, 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 as you were talking. And uh, when I was invited to come and talk to you guys, I was, I was wondering like how, because, because lately um, the medical field is a very lonely, very withdrawal, um, very isolating profession. I've been at university for 14 years. Most of the time I was always in a hostel or I was always in a foreign country. So, so, so your, your, your mental uh, adaptation and, and uh, your, uh, your relevance also completely changes. And I think you and me as professionals, we, we, we are similar in that fashion. Why am I saying that? The low hanging fruit for us is perhaps social advocacy. But social advocacy in terms of bringing the agenda to see that we are having a population. <laughs> because, because personally speaking, and, and when I sort of decided to take part, the world is what it is, not because of bad men, but because of the silence of good men. It sounds cliche, but it is a fact. And then when you journalists come to me that I studied something, and then somehow we, we see that we actually professionally really the same. We are all healing the nation in a bigger... So, so you and I sort of become academically and, and socially connected to sort of bring a certain level of awareness in our societies. And for me, that is my low hanging fruit that you and I, at a philosophical level, we, we, we take the selfishness of, of what a human being is away. And then when you are mentioning USA, it, for some reason, the, the humanity is, is, is equal. It, the way, there is something that's happening between me and my seniors. And then, uh, I've got very big uh, seniors that are very well known in society, if I mention their names. But, but for them, I, I've been telling them, look, our health system needs us to talk about it because it's inadequate. Now, many of them have been in the health system longer than I have. And, and when you talk to them, they, they, they're not because it, it sort of, uh, Freddie, it sort of points at you. And, and we should move away from that as a society to say, if me and Mr. Lengs brings up topic of saying uh, uh, our healthcare is inadequate, we are not saying you are a failure. We are saying that we need to move into this direction. For example, we are in Namibia, and, and you have mentioned the fact that the vast majority of our, our nation is dry. Yet we have the entire... Uh, <laughs> Northeastern Namibia, where the water is just going into, I don't know, uh, God's green earth. <laughs> Yet, when you see our political leadership, uh, somehow we need to tell them that, look, we need to have an agenda. We need to have an agenda where we are saying, this part of our country, you and me, we are together deciding that we are producing food there. This part of the country, there's a lot of sun 
and there's a lot of wind drain lutherates. We are producing electricity there. So, 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 so that is the excitement part, Mr. Lynx. That, that is our low hanging fruit. That we should make this sort of interaction, multi uh, professional interaction. One would love to have engineers involved, journalists involved, politicians involved. That, that we town this, but interprofessional. Uh, and after that, your material that you write, you write from because you are influencing what what we start thinking about so that when I sit in a meeting and I'm a town planner I'm like okay Mr. Lynx spoke about me building roads like this why am I congesting these roads because you must realize that we can no longer allow politicians alone to rule the world that, that cannot be allowed they are a disaster if they are left alone and most of them, even though they belong to different political parties, they are more the same than different. So this is the low hanging fruit, I, I, I believe. The fact that you have brought this topic to me and we are discussing, and we are saying that we can no longer look at USA as a world leader or who, who. It's about you and my community. What are our issues? Who's bringing those issues? You are the, the one that's, uh, that, that knows about bringing issues. Uh, who do I consult? Let me call Dr. Ganyemba, he's the one that, and the, we realize I'm so happy about, that is why discussing with you today is something exciting and I think that's our low hanging fruit. Let's move, move as, as different, um, um, whatever, different careers, but with you, because you are the one that, that, that that I read or for what, what informs what I read. And then the information will change our societies. People, when they start voting, will, will look at our politicians and say, but you are not really addressing what Dr. Kanyemba and Dr. Mr. Lengs were talking about. Here you are ED of health, you were so, talking yesterday, but the things you are saying and you know, the way Kanyemba and Mr. You understand. So that is perhaps our, our low hanging fruit. And so that we inform our society and we say, let's move into this direction better because that will be something that's good for all of us, not just for you, but for all of us. And then one of the, 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 the most, and then that's actually what I was thinking about is the philosophical part of life where, where it's beyond you and me. Um, without being, uh, being religious about it, but, but the life that we create more than the life that we'll, we'll, we'll to sort of prepare for the future that you and I will not take part in. And by the way, that's where viruses are interesting. Viruses are not really living, yet they are also not really dead. They are actually a bunch of, of, of uh, DNA, RNA, which is just... Uh, a bunch of elements grouped together uh, who the main thing that they want to do is to survive. Now to survive, you cannot do. So in, remember Mr. Lynx, COVID-19 cannot destroy us because it needs and then we are seeing that we probably only have a few minutes. It, it sort of drives us also to, to think about the future future while we are living at the, on, 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 at the present. And then that's what, as you were talking, that, that's what came to my mind. And then, uh, yeah, that, that's, that's probably our low hanging fruit. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think, I mean, the awareness raising. Uh, so, I mean, the whole, you know, we have to speak to public and, and so, to the public and so on. And, 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 in, and in a way that they understand, wherever they are, Chumque. In, in the far reaches of, of um, the Kunene region. Um, I, I fully agree with you. That was Dr. Stanley Kanyemba speaking to us on this session of Ask the Experts. Once again, apologies for the abrupt end to this session. It was certainly beyond our control and we hope it wasn't too much of a disappointment at the end there. Ask the Experts is brought to you by Namibia Media Trust. And please be on the lookout for all our future sessions of Ask the Experts. We hope you have a wonderful day and we look forward to you being part of Ask the Experts at future occasions. Goodbye.